Good evening. Welcome to our Lessons and Carols service uh, on this Christmas Eve. Um, and a special welcome to those of you who are worshiping and joining us at home as well. This is one of those services where, where what we do is we read through gospel and we sing carols. And in the reading of the gospel and in the singing of the carols, you know, the story of Christmas, the story of salvation, the story of redemption is told. So I invite you to um, stand for the call to worship. So sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. The Lord has made his salvation known. And his he has remembered his love and his faithfulness to Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. And hear God's greeting from uh, the book of Revelation. Grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spears before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is a faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. Amen. And as God has greeted us from his word, I invite you to turn and just give a greeting to each other. Greetings to you at home as well. Let's sing, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus. seated. Lessons and carols. There are nine lessons and from this point uh, as we go through lessons we'll just be going through them without announcement. Uh, we'll have different readers come up um, but we'll just flow from the readings and the lessons into the carols. So we begin after the dawn of human history, in the Garden of Eden, there God made Adam, his wife Eve, and all humanity in his image, that they might rightly know God, their creator, heartily love him, and live with him in eternal blessedness, as we find in the Heidelberg Catechism. As image bearers of God, we were made in a covenant relationship with God, but broke that bond of fellowship when Adam and Eve sinned by eating of the forbidden tree. Thus the Lord, came, the Lord God came to judge Adam and Eve and the serpent for what they had done. Yet in the midst of sin, disobedience, and the pronouncement of a curse, we hear the first news of Christmas. From the woman, who would, from the woman would come one who would crush the serpent 
and the sin and death he brought upon the human race. First lesson comes from Genesis 3, verses 8 through 15. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, The woman you put here with me, she gave me some of the fruit from the tree, and I ate it. And the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will crush his heel. This is the word of the Lord. The plot of Christmas is unfolded throughout the generations. The promised seed, beginning with Abel and continuing through Seth, was dramatically saved from the flood in Noah and multiplied in the families of Shem, one of Noah's three children. God was then pleased to choose Abram, one of these descendants, to bring the promised seed of the woman. Abram's blessed seed would bless not only Abram's family for generations to come, but the families of all people on earth. The second lesson, Genesis 22, 15 through 18. Then the angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven a second time and said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, 
that because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies, and through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. This is the word of the Lord. After receiving God's steadfast love for generation after generation, the people of God rebelled like their first father, Adam. Jacob's Jacob's sons sold their brother into slavery, yet the Lord used Joseph to preserve Israel from famine in Egypt. Two Israelites caused Moses to go into exile for 40 years in Midian. Yet he was the Lord's anointed one who displayed signs and wonders and led the people out of Egypt. Millions of Jews stuck between the Red Sea and Pharaoh's chariots forgot the Lord's salvation. Yet in power and grace, God split the sea in two and caused them to pass through on dry ground while destroying Pharaoh's armies in the sea. The people complained about not having bread, water, or meat, Yet the Lord sent them manna from heaven, water from a rock, and more quail than they could eat. The people built a golden calf to worship, yet the Lord forgave their sin. The spies did not believe they could overcome the inhabitants of the land, yet the Lord later led them through Joshua to destroy the enemies of God. Generation after generation rebelled until the Lord allowed them to be enslaved again in a foreign land by their enemies. Yet the Lord delivered them through judges. In the 7th century B.C., the people broke their covenant with the Lord again. The ten northern tribes of Israel were sent into Assyria, and the two southern tribes of Judah would be next by the Babylonians. Then the Lord promised disbelieving Ahaz that he would climatically save them again, this time by coming to his people. Third lesson from Isaiah 7, chapter 10 through 14. Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz, Ask the Lord your God for a sign, whether in the deepest depths or in the highest heights. But Ahaz said, I will not ask. I will not put the Lord to the test. Then Isaiah said, Hear now, you house of David. Is it not enough to try the patience of humans? Will you try the patience of my God also? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. This is the word of the Lord.
Emmanuel, God with us, was to be the name of the virgin's son. This surely would be the greatest and most mysterious sign and wonder God would do. What would Jesus' birth mean to God's people? What would he mean to God-fearers among the nations who dwelt in the darkness of ignorance, idolatry, and unbelief? The fourth lesson comes to us from Isaiah 9, 2 to 7. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as warriors rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the days of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. offspring would be a king and his kingdom would be one of peace ending the serpent's reign over the Lord's people yet where was he to be born? Would it be in the palaces of royalty and aristocracy? The fifth lesson from Micah 5 But you Bethlehem Ephrathah 
Though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. Therefore Israel will be abandoned until a time when she who is in labor bears a son, and the rest of his brothers return to join the Israelites. He will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they will live securely, for then his greatness will reach to the ends of the earth, and he will be our peace. When the Assyrians invade our land and march through our fortresses, this is the word of the Lord. Promises, promises, so many promises. Yet where was this promise of God coming in the flesh? Where was this seed of the woman to crush the serpent? Where was Abraham's offspring who would bless? Where was the virgin's son, the king upon David's throne, who was to reign forever? Where was this Lord, this shepherd of whom Israel sang? You see, after the preaching of Isaiah and Micah, God's people languished for more than 700 years without these prophecies coming to pass. Yet now the strife is ended. Now God is no longer silent. Why so downcast, O Israel of God? Lift up your hearts and heads and hear the long-expected words of fulfillment. The sixth lesson, from Luke 1, verses 26 to 38. Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city in Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph, of the descendants of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. Coming in, he said to her, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was very perplexed at this statement and kept pondering what kind of salutation this was. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. He will be great, and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. 
Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? The angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And for that reason, the Holy Child shall be called the Son of God. And behold, even your relative Elizabeth has also conceived a son in her old age, and she who is called barren is now in her sixth month, for nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, the bondservant of the Lord, may it be done to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. The The gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. providence of God. Caesar Augustus called for a taxation of the land in the year in which Mary was to give birth to the Son of God, Jesus Christ, our Lord. So everyone had to return to their hometowns. Joseph and Mary traveled to Bethlehem that the scripture might be fulfilled. Listen to one commentator describing our next lesson. Throughout the centuries, God had so led the course of history that everything was now prepared for the coming of his son. The preparatory Old Testament revelation had been completed long ago. The weary, longing spirit of humanity was in dire need of his coming. His forerunner, John, had already been born. The fullness of time had arrived. And at last... The promised Redeemer, whose coming had been looked forward to with so much heartfelt yearning, is born. In a few verses, written simply, in a matter-of-fact and natural way, Luke relates the tremendous and all-important event. The seventh lesson from Luke 2. In those days... Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone went to their own town to register. Also, Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. And while they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger 
because there was no guest room available for them. The Gospel of the Lord. After this stupendous wonder of God, we see the true nature of God's kingdom revealed in those who first beheld him and in the humble surroundings of his birth. He was not adored by throngs of millions, thousands, or even hundreds, but by some shepherds who happened to be in an adjacent field. He was not first visited by the powerful, the influential, the important, but by the least of this world. And when the angel told them where to find this child, it was not on a throne or in a palace, but enthroned in a trough, wrapped in the swaddling clothes of an ordinary baby, Truly, he who was rich became poor for our sake, so that we, by his poverty, might become rich. Eighth lesson, Luke 2, 8 through 16. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over the flocks by night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone round them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find the babe wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. 
When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. The word of the Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. change it up just how many of you know it with the words ear <laughs> sechot how would you like to sing it one more time but singing it with those words they just flow a little bit more nicer than the english so would you like to sing it you know it by heart right <laughs> okay. let's sing it one more time and let's sing it using ear <laughs> sechot
after Jesus was born, he was visited by magi who were princely men from the east. In scripture, going east is east of Eden, away from the presence of God. Here these magi are going from east to west as they approach the very holy of holies in the person of Jesus, in whom the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. The age-old strife between the two seeds, the, the woman and the serpent, Christ and Satan, the godly and the ungodly, is still active. And thus we see the reason Jesus came, to destroy the works of the devil. Matthew 2, verses 1 through 12. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. Oh, when King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. Well, in Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and, and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me, so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they were overjoyed. And on coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. The Gospel of the Lord.
amazing wonder God has done in sending his eternal son to become human and yet remain God. The birth of God in the flesh. For here we see that the seed of the woman, the seed of Abraham, the son of the virgin, the son given unto us, the one who was to be a ruler from Bethlehem, was in truth God in the flesh, veiled in flesh, the Godhead see, hail the incarnate deity. The ninth lesson, and it comes to us from John 1, verses 1 through 14. The Word became flesh. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that he that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light, he came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or of a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. This grace 
that came through Jesus Christ. Grace that forgives the sins of a misspent past, the struggles of the present, and the sins of the future is offered to all who by faith unite themselves to the humiliation, lowliness, suffering, and shame of the one who came from heaven to earth, that we might rise from earth to heaven. Amen. Thanks be to God. As we prepare to, to leave from our worship, we leave with this prayer from the liturgy of Heidelberg from 1563. So let's pray. Eternal and almighty God, we give you most hearty thanks that in your great love you graciously pitied us who were doomed to eternal death for our sins and ordained your only begotten Son before the foundation of the world was laid to be our mediator, atonement, and savior, that he was promised unto our first parents in paradise after their deplorable fall, and at the appointed time was sent into the world, that he assumed our flesh and blood, became our brother, and in all things like unto sin accepted. We praise you that by his death he destroyed him who had the power of death, the devil, and delivered us, who must otherwise have spent our whole life in bondage to the fear of death, from the kingdom of Satan and darkness, and translated us into the kingdom of light and eternal happiness. We heartily beseech you to fill us with your grace, that we might rightly know this your love and mercy, and Jesus Christ your Son, whom you have made unto us for wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption, and so love and honor him as holy to surrender ourselves up unto him, to confide in him, and esteem everything in the world as dross and dung for the excellency of the knowledge of Jesus Christ. And may we cling unto the Savior with true faith, who forgives all our sins and heals all our diseases, that we may rejoice in all the tribulations of this life and sing with the heavenly host, glory to God in the highest, peace on earth and goodwill towards men, and finally attain unto the end of our faith even the salvation of our souls. We entreat you also for all the governments of the world. Grant unto our rulers grace and peace, that they govern those placed under them in your fear and with your approbation, that righteousness may be promoted and iniquity be checked and punished, that we may fulfill our days in quietness and peace as becomes Christians, confirm all weak and disconsolate spirits, and send down upon, the, upon us your peace through Jesus Christ our Lord who has taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We're going to end our service with the carol, Silent Night, Holy Night. And I, we invite you, um, during the singing of the carol, to come up and to light your candle from the Christ candle as well, as Christ's light flows out into the world. And then return to your seats. But we ask you to come up just a couple of rows at a time and then just kind of come around and then back to your seats. And then afterwards, we'll have the benediction and then we'll go back out into the world. So silent night, holy night.
light your candles or you want to light your candle from the front? Hear now the benediction. May Jesus Christ, the Son of Righteousness, who comes with healing in his wings, fill you with the joy and peace that passes all understanding. The blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen. So go and shine the light of Christ into our dark world. May the Lord bless you and be with you.